All right, so they've been hitting us hard and heavy with the nostalgia throughout the run of Season 3 of Star Trek Picard. And this episode is no different, because not only do we get our first full reveal of sexy old man Worf, who is just, ah, chef's kiss, but also another Deep Space Nine would return, which I'm not going to talk about till after the break moment here, because i got to tell everybody, remember, I don't do spoiler free. So if you don't want things spoiled... Don't watch this episode until you've actually gone and watched the show. Because I'm talking all the things, including that spoiler I just kind of teased there. Um, so without further ado, um, you've been given your warning. You've got five seconds, four seconds, three seconds, two seconds. And we're good. So into my show notes here. Episode three of season one. It's called 17 Seconds. And the changelings are back. That was not a... Uh, plot twist I saw coming. Uh, some of the things that I've seen them do with the nostalgia bait here in Season 3 of Picard has been a little bit predictable. It's been very fun, though. And I think that's what's brought a lot of people back. And I know a lot of people have been out there talking about how Season 3 is the, what they should have started with. Um, seasons 1 and 2 were crap. This is, this is the one they should have done. I mean, it's definitely one of the routes they could have taken. Uh, but I think what most people can agree on is that this is a really good season. And the first two episodes kind of set everything up. We've got multiple plots going down here. We've got, you know, this ship and this captain who seems to be tracking them for some odd reason and obsessed with finding Jack Crusher and and tracking him in Beverly and, and there's stuff going on there. Then there's the Raffi plot line, trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, plots being stolen, the portal device. Um, that came into play even more in this episode. But then having all of this be potentially masterminded by this terrorist group of the changelings was i thought a, a really interesting way to give a throwback because we get mention of the dominion war again and i loved deep space nine as much as i love the next generation oh uh, man i'm always torn about whether deep space nine is better than next generation because next generation i think was a funner show but deep space nine was a better show from a storyline perspective that's just my opinion Everybody's welcome to theirs. And in any case, I need to shut up and get to my show notes. Uh, this episode starts off with... They, they, they really do know how to do space battles these days. Um, that shot as they're coming up out of the nebula and it comes up and then comes towards the camera. And behind them, they've got the 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 other Captain Vatic, I think is her name, and her ship, the Shrike, shooting at them through the nebula. Just kudos to the VFX team for pulling this off because it looked really, really, really well done. We also um, get this intro sequence of a flashback to Ricard and, uh, Picard and Riker celebrating the birth of Riker's son. They've used some de-aging technology here, but i got to say it's not as good as what they're using with um, Star Wars. Sorry. It didn't look that that good. It's my... As much as I'm praising the VFX team for the battle... for the, for the, the nebula shot, um, eh, this one's not so good. It's all good. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, but I did find it kind of quirky um we continue to move forward as you know it's it's basically this whole episode is about the ship in crisis and honestly as as good as some of the moments of this episode were i'm never a big fan of ship in crisis episodes and the reason is because i feel like that's a weak story to tool because how many episodes do we get of any given season where there's a ship in in chaos episode like ship in distress like oh the warp core broke or this thing happened oh we can't fly because of this we can't do this i'm not a fan of that because it is a way overdone trope and it's definitely at the foreground of this episode so i actually did a little bit of like skim watching this episode because there was a lot of just mindless running around because things are exploding and they're getting attacked and every time they come out into the nebula the shrike is there waiting for them and and there was a lot of that going on and that got a little old but there is some unique oops i moved the wrong thing there sorry there is some unique um moments in our there are some unique moments here such as this uh dialogue between laforge's daughter and seven and nine about belonging and how you know her dad you know 
wouldn't have put up with it because Jordy was the kind of guy who's, you know, all about being the best. And she's talking about how LaForge's daughter is talking about how no one wanted to accept her at the beginning because they thought she was just there because of who her dad was. But eventually, you know, she proved that she was capable. And so she's giving this pep speech basically to Seven of Mine that, you know, don't it doesn't matter if Shaw pulled your rank. Um, you know, you're still Commander Seven to me. And I was it felt a little Cheesy, but also it was a fun dialogue moment of, of the recognition, though, and it gives Seven of Nine the motivation that she needs to get out of her funk. But meanwhile, we see Doc uh, Beverly back in sick bay, and she's up and about trying to help all these sick people coming into sick bay, even though that she herself has been injured. Um, and then we get <clears throat> Picard and Riker coming in. And we know now that it's time for a reckoning between Picard and Beverly. And this is a pretty drawn-out scene, which I think gives both of these actors a chance to really get out some good dialogue. And this is basically just the story of, you know, two people who tried to make it work, you know, four or five, six different relationships over the years, trying to, you know, figure out how going to make it happen. And then eventually, you know, she got pregnant and she realized that, you know, Picard was never going to be able to be a dad because the pull of the galaxy was too much. And every time she turned around, he was getting shot at. You know, the Starfleet was needing him for something. Continual attempts on his life. It's not a safe place for a child. Um, And he's pissed. And I think rightfully so, because he literally gives her this speech. Um, How dare you take me confiding you? Because she accuses him at one point of being just like his dad. And he's like, how dare you take me confiding you about my father and using that to cut me out of making the biggest decision of my life. And I'm just like, this is really good acting and really good writing here. What might I have been? A father? A husband? But I was robbed of that decision by you. And I was just like, oh, this is a 20-year-old breakup scene that's been, you know, uh, brewing for a while. Um, There is also the follow-up sequence to this is Riker kind of chuckling to himself as he's walking Jack Pace the halls. And Crusher telling him, young Crusher, stop staring, I'm not a science experiment. (laughs) And Riker goes, man, I spent 20 years on a spaceship watching you get cooked up before you were born. And I honestly, that was the biggest chuckle I got out of this episode. <laughs> he's like, he's talking about, you know, watching Beverly and, and Picard, you know, have this relationship over 20 years. Uh, I thought it was a cute little, a cute little line here. Um, there's an allu- uh, some discussion here about alluding to the fact that Riker... Um, has a you know he has his wife and daughter but the son is missing and I don't remember if they've addressed what happened to the son I can't remember that in the previous in the previous season or not when we met up with Riker in any case um Beverly starts to think that Vatic isn't after Jack at all but so she's been he's been that uh, she Vatic has been sent by some larger than life characters who want to get to Picard which would make sense given that the show is called Picard um yeah um Riker wants Picard to man up and talk to Jack. After all, he lost his son somehow. And says, you don't want to miss out on these moments. But Picard is so focused on, I have to be the, the captain of the ship and I have to get them out of here and i got to put this right. Um, you know, he's he's hyper-focused on that right now. We do have a scene on the bridge um, where the Shrike is coming around and Captain Vatic is, she says, she says a line here. She says, Titan is right where it should be. And I, I'm like, are they somehow being able to predict? And I think maybe this ties into what they talk about later on when they when they say they're able to track the vessel. Um, I was thinking it had to do with something else, but then the tracking of the vessel came into play later on. So we'll see if that pans out in the long run. Um, in any case, they get to the bridge. Shaw gets injured, transfers control to Riker. There's some banter between Riker and Picard. Um, you can call me number one now. You know, it's like, ah, that's cute, but also cringy. But also that next scene of sexy old man Worf staying in shape and doing all of his battle meditation and he, you know, Raffi comes in and he spiels off all of his titles, you know, Slayer of Garan, and I have made some chamomile tea. Would you like some sugar? <laughs> and I was just like, oh, it's freaking awesome. I love Worf. Um, one of the reasons I am I was interested to see them make these Deep Space Nine throwbacks is because Worf got a really, a much better storyline in Deep Space Nine than he had in Next Generation. Um, anyway, um, Raffi finds out that... Uh, Worf's actually the one who was her handler in the first couple of episodes. Um, and they've 
figured out that there's this guy called Titus Rika who paid the Ferengi to lie. And they need to track this dude down. So they're off to another planet to do that. Meanwhile, we're back to the nebula. The other captain is chasing, you know, Vatic is chasing in the Shrike. And we, just when we think that the Titan is going to get away, um, she says, deploy the device or ready the device. And it shoots out a portal in front of the Titan. The Titan goes through and then appears right back in the nebula in front of the Shrike again. So they're using the same technology that was used on the planet to put below that building, which then put it up in the sky and destroyed it all. So that portal tech. Um, then we're back to Worf and Raffi on the planet. <sighs> Excuse me, chasing this guy down. The banter between the two is a lot of fun. Um, it's also not... This is more just chase sequence stuff, so it's not... You're not necessarily moving the plot forward a lot, um, but they do get the occasional banter, which makes it pretty light and fun. Uh, and then we're back to the ship, and Jack figures out that they're being tracked somehow, and he's got to go find out why. Uh, there's also a disagreement between Ricard, uh, Picard and Riker. Riker wants to get everyone home. Picard wants to stand and fight. Um, Riker's starting to get a little annoyed with his old friend. Um, Jack and Seven figure out that, um, you know, somebody's tracking them through some gas. Who knows? Who cares? It doesn't matter what it's called. It's the ship thing. Remember, it's that something's wrong with the ship. So uh, Jack goes down. He confronts a shapeshifter. And this was the first moment when I went, oh, wait a minute. Shapeshifters, is that just a normal shapeshifter or is that something more? Um, and then we're right after that off to Raffi and Worf um, kept questioning this dude and he starts to flip out too, and we realize, or Worf realizes that, oh, you're a changeling from the Great Link. Um, and I was like, oh, we're getting more Deep Space Nine lore. That's awesome. Um, and they start to theorize that maybe that attack on Daystrom um, was just a feint, and that they stole something else, and that the portal technology was just a distraction. So we're going to be finding out more about that as we get into this season. Meanwhile, the saboteur on board the Titan. Uh, kills her warp drive. Um, Picard and Riker are there. They they make an attack, and um, the Shrike uses the portal device to re reroute their torpedoes and hit the Titan, which sends it spiraling without control down into the heart of the gravitational center of the nebula. As the Shrike disappears and leaves them to their fate, and uh, Riker is pissed. And literally, as we end the episode, he just turns to Picard. He's like, remove yourself from the bitch. You've just killed us all. And I went, hmm, trouble's brewing at home. So, at the end of the day, um, I'm not going to give this episode a 10 out of 10 like I did the previous two. And the reason for that is because of some of the tropiness of this. I give this one an 8 out of 10. Still a great episode. Um, I love the Worf and Raffi stuff. Uh, I love the Deep Space Nine lore. Um, I loved the scene between Picard and and and, and Beverly uh, dealing with 20 years of emotional repression and her taking that choice away from him and not even giving him the opportunity to even see if he could be a father. Um, there were some really good, there were some great nuggets throughout this episode, but ultimately also ship, you know, chaos, problems with the ship stuff, and then the chase sequences and the planets is. Raffi and Worf were chasing to do through the streets. Some of that felt like it was a little bit too much, like it was just padding out the episode. And this is the first time I'm going to say something that is it's going to be controversial, but I've never said it here. As much as I will sometimes complain that the Mandalorian episodes are too short sometimes, there's one thing you can't say about the Mandalorian, and that's that it has too much fat on its bones because they have made the Mandalorian as lean as possible. Some of those episodes might be 40 minutes long. Most of them are like 30. You've had occasionally some are shorter here and there, but they keep those stories tight and clean because there's no fat on them. And I think this episode could have, you know, ultimately, you know, benefited from a little bit of fat trimming, but still a great episode. Can't wait to see where we're going deeper into it. If you like this, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. Let me know your thoughts down below. Support if you can with super chats, super thanks, super stickers, memberships here on YouTube. Don't forget the Patreon page. Picking them out. There's pre-programmed amounts, but you can also choose your own if you just want to throw like 43 cents at something. It's weird. It's crazy. Do what you want. Till next time, everybody. Stay safe. Happy watching. <laughs>